Well, the motor's gone along with a lot of other things. Man, this thing's been sitting here so long, I forgot what year it is. It's a 92 model, and we used the motor for a dyno segment a while back. But before that, do you remember what this car was used for? Absolutely. It was a pony we used for a mule, right? See, your mind's still all there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember using the 92 LX to demonstrate an in-car cam swap. And later, we treated it to upgrades like high-performance heads and a new trick flow intake. Oh, we even put it on the bottle with a fairly basic fogger system. And best I remember, our top chassis dyno run was about 380 horsepower. Months later, Lou and I attacked it with a plasma cutter to back half the car and give it a four-link suspension. Now, Lou built a cage for it, and we even took it to the track for some shakedown runs. And I never forgot what I told Lou after the final pass. We've got one little problem. What's that? A little too much car, not enough motor. Hey, that is not my problem, that's yours. That is, and I've got a small block turbo on my mind. It's gonna be a lot of work, but you know, I'm glad we're following up on your idea. A turbo Mustang, that's a first for us. Yeah, it's gonna be worth it, because it's gonna be a lot of fun to drive, too. You know what, Ian owes us a little favor. Remember that big block Chevy we built for his mud truck? Yeah. Well, he's got all the steel in the tube shark, so we'll have him finish off the cage. All right, let's check up on Buddy now. Oh, one more thing, there. Man, this block looks killer. I'm really glad World helped us out with it. Yeah, me too, and it's got some really nice features. It's a high cast iron block, has a deck height of 9.500, and has been clearanced to accept four and a quarter inch stroker cranks. It has expanded water jackets to help for cooling. Now, we won't use them, but it has two extra bolt holes per cylinder, and ours came with four bolt billet splayed caps. Now, you might want to ask, is this uh, turbo stain motor destined for the street or the strip? Well, the answer is yes, a little of both. But to handle the horsepower we're going to throw at it, 900 plus, has to have a stout bottom end. The crankshaft comes from Crower. It's a 4340 chrome molly forging that's been vacuumed degassed, and it has straight shot oiling. Oh, and check out how they've knife edged the counterweights. These maxi light rods also came from Crower, and they utilize a radial beam technology design. Now, this allows them to remove excess weight from low stress areas, making them a light rod while also keeping the rigidity. Now, these things are also made from 4340 chrome molly steel, and they utilize a 7 16 rod bolt. Now, these CP pistons, well, they only weigh 512 grams, and they're almost too pretty to put into an engine. I'll say, maybe we should hang these on the wall, but <laughs> people from CP wouldn't like that. Now, the diameter is 4.0. 025. The dish is 177 thousandths. Oh, and they use a ring pack that's really cool, but we'll show you that later when we install them. We're using coated calico bearings in the whole bottom end. By the way, the cam bearings and cam go in the same location as the factory Ford motor. Now here's how I get caught up in my work, lubing up the main bearings. Using Royal Purple's Max Tough Assembly Lube. Now we can drop in the crank and be careful not to hit the studs with the crank journals. Install the main caps with more bearing loop. I usually put a little bit of silicone underneath the cap to eliminate most of your oil leaks. Now torque down the main studs. Now what I talked about earlier about the splayed bolts, what that means is the outer bolts are angled to go into the block where most of the meat is. Now lube up the piston pin bosses and the rod, then insert the pin. Then the spiral locks to hold the pin in place. These CP rings look like other sets we've used, but the top and second rings are thinner. And that means less drag inside the cylinders, plus the top ring comes file fit to your specs. Now it's time to drop the pistons in. And be careful not to hit the journal with the edge of the rod. The cam we're using also comes from Crower with a lift of 158 on the intake, 133 on the exhaust. And the advertised duration is 283 intake, 276 exhaust. We're using Loctite to keep the bolts snug on this cam plate. We can't use any washers because of clearance issues. This timing chain is a hex adjust double roller from Cloyce. With the hex adjust setup, it allows us to rotate the fuel pump eccentric two degree increments to advance it to a total of six or retard it two degree increments for a total of six. With us, we're gonna set it up straight up. Any stock style timing cover will fit, like this one we got from Summit. Here's a heads up though, be careful knocking in the front seal. If you knock out this spring, you're asking for a leak. Put some silicone on the cover to hold the gaskets in place and to help seal it, then install it. 
Well, we got our world block just about filled up, but there's a lot more in store for this project, like cylinder heads that'll handle the horsepower of a turbo stain. Coming right up. Hey, we're back and we're ready to install these high port race heads that have been CNC machined. Now they're made by Trick Flow Specialties and we actually got them from Summit Racing. Now the intake runners measure up at 225 cc's, the exhaust runner at 95. Now the combustion chamber, well they come in at 70 and check this out. We even had them O-ring to handle all that extra boost we're going to be throwing in this motor. And to keep them in place, we're going to be using Felpro gaskets and of course ARP head studs. Now our whole valve train combination came from Crower, including the solid roller lifters. Now unlike hydraulic roller lifters, solid rollers will make more power because they stay more consistent in tolerances, and they'll last a lot longer too. Next we can install the bars for our rocker arm. The push rods are a one piece design made from chrome moly heat treated steel. The rocker arms are stainless steel with a 1.6 ratio. We got ours with needle bearing roller tips. Stud mounted rockers are fine for most applications, but a shaft mounted setup like this can handle the higher spring rates you experience in competition. Now we want to check our valve train geometry and you want your roller tip to be just off center of the valve stem. If it's too far inboard, you want to use these shims supplied in the kit to raise up the rocker arm stand to get you in the right geometry. Right now we're dropping on the gasket so we can install our lower trick flow intake manifold. Now this is the Box R series and it's been computer engineered to deliver a balance of airflow distribution and velocity. Now it has runners that measure 2 by 1.2 inches and they're actually 11 inches long with the upper portion installed. Now that'll give us great low end torque and a lot of high RPM horsepower. Now it also has an RPM range from 25 to 7500 RPM. After we install the ARP bolts, we'll torque them down using a three-step pattern. Next thing we do is bolt this one-inch spacer to the bottom half of the upper intake manifold. Then we can drop the assembly onto the lower manifold studs. And don't forget to install the O-ring or else you'll have big time leaks. Finally, the top half bolts up. By the way, this trick flow setup is designed for use with factory or aftermarket fuel rails and it comes with a 90 millimeter throttle body opening. And the throttle body that makes up to it is this F90 from AccuFab that's machined out of one solid piece of billet aluminum. Now it's got a location for an IAC or idle air control that we'll block off with this plate since we're not using it. It also accepts a Ford throttle position sensor that bolts up here. And check this out. The lip has been machined to accept a four inch clamshell clamp so we won't be blowing off any hoses when that turbo starts making boost. Now since our intake manifold setup is so tall, we're installing this throttle body with the actuator on bottom. With the 160 pound blue top injectors from Bosch installed in the UPR billet fuel rail, it's ready to go in place on the intake. Well, let's go ahead and button up the bottom end with our oiling system. We got this high volume oil pump from an O'Reilly parts store and we're using it with a Mylodon pickup and one of their street strip oil pans with a deep sump low profile design. It's also got internal baffling, which should be good for freeing up some horsepower. Because of the increased capacity and ease of change, we're gonna use a remote oil filter. So we have to use this adapter kit from Mylodon and the oil filter itself will mount up here, bolted up inside the car. To prevent torsional vibration, we're using an ATI super damper made exclusively for high performance engines. After knocking the hub onto the crankshaft, we can install the balancer, which has laser engraved timing marks. While we're up here, the water pump can go on too. It's a Mazir 300 series that flows up to 55 gallons per hour. That's enough for a 2,000 horse Pro Mod motor. So what do you think, buddy? Uh, it'll be interesting to see what numbers we pull on the dyno. Oh yeah. Well, with this, we got what we need for phase two of our turbo tank project. Feast your eyes on this. The guys at Hellion Power Systems hooked us up with a system that includes a Turbonetics 88 millimeter turbocharger, comes with an F189 3.5 inch wheel, and it's in a mid-sized frame for lightning fast spool up, 
and can produce up to 50 PSI. It's the same setup you see in a lot of pro outlaw race cars. Now, next week here in the shop, with any luck, we'll put it all together, take it to the dyno, and hopefully make a thousand horsepower or more. Well, it'll be good. Have you ever had one of those annoying vibrations that seem to appear at different speeds but disappear while you slow down? Well, if you know your wheels are balanced and all your drivetrain mounts are satisfactory, there's a good chance it's your U-joints. For this tech tip, we're going to show you how to replace worn universal joints in a drive shaft so they last a lot longer and rotate a lot smoother. Now, there are a couple ways that the joints are secured in a drive shaft, and we're going to cover some of those today. First, mark the yoke and the shaft for orientation. GM uses a urethane they inject into the groove to hold them in place. To remove the urethane, you're going to need a pair of safety glasses and a torch. Start by heating the area around the bearing cup. Once it is hot enough, the heat will force the urethane out of the hole and empty from the groove. Now, if you don't have a set of big torches like we used, a small handheld will work. It'll just take you a little bit longer to do it. Now that the drive shaft's cooled off, we can go ahead and remove our caps, set the drive shaft up on the vise, and now it's time to remove the joint. Here's a groove we are talking about where the urethane retains the universal joint into the drive shaft. On the replacement one, it uses a retaining clip, and that's a lot nicer than using the hot urethane. To get started on the new U-joint, remove two caps, making sure the bearings stay put. Now place the joint into the yoke and slide the caps into the ears. Now place it in a vise and slowly tighten, pressing in the caps. Then install the retaining clips and do the same thing to connect the yoke to the shaft. And don't forget the reference marks. Finally, with the Zerk fitting in, fill the U-joint with grease and check it for smooth operation. After installing the U-joint, you want to tape up the caps to keep them from falling off, because if they do, you'll have needle bearings all over the floor. All right, one down, one to go. Now, this style actually uses a clip on the outside of the cup. The only problem with these can actually happen during installation. If the cups are pressed on too tight, it can cause the inside of the U-joint to ride against the inside of the cup. Now, this will cause a lot of heat and push all the grease out, which will eventually result in premature bearing failure. Start by removing the retaining clips with pliers. Then, using a socket and hammer, tap the old caps out, being careful not to damage the shaft. Now, grease up the needle bearings and tighten the caps with the vise. Last is to reinstall the new clips. Have you ever noticed that a Ford shaft is usually a little bigger than a Chevrolet's? That's because they got a hole of junk in the trunk. All right, replacing your U-joint should take you about an hour and a half. The cost may vary a little, but on an average, it'll cost you about 45 bucks for parts. The benefit is a smoother ride without the vibration, and hopefully you get rid of that annoying clunk when you drop the vehicle into gear. Now, next on Horsepower, you know how much we love grassroots racing. Well, this time, it's not about reaction times or ETs. It's all about high speeds, fast moves, and a lot of left-hand turns. Feed me money. And done. Hey, welcome back. Ever wonder what we like to do on our free time? Well, in addition to a lot of hunting and fishing, I like to help some friends out at our local circle track who race stock cars. Now, Joe likes to hang out there quite a bit too, and we thought it would be fun to follow a racer who's on the home stretch to a championship. It's Testa Day. Three days before the 50th anniversary race at this legendary 5 8 mile track. Andy Johnson's on a win streak with big hopes for his first late model class championship. They usually run at night, 9 30, 10 o'clock, and this week it's a 5 o'clock race, so yeah, we're trying to get tuned in for the daylight hours. After a few test laps, Andy's longtime crew chief, Billy Sisko, wants to swap out the right rear spring. We're just trying to come down off the spring to give it enough forward grip off the form. That's where we've been hurting. If you're having an issue like that at night, it's going to be worse in the day. 
he, he's probably the reason this car is going so fast now. I mean, he's been in it a whole lot longer than I have. And, and he's really smart. And he's got a ton of laps here. I mean, he's super experienced here and uh, got a good race car. You know, I mean, everybody's doing their job. And we got a pretty good motor there with Kevin Fisher. And it's a great engine, you know, and uh, that's kind of a, a topic of conversation here lately. You know, why is a $5,000 crate motor outrun a $20,000 built motor? We don't know. <laughs> After a second test run, Andy's not too happy with the spring swap. It didn't hurt it. Okay. You want to put that back in it and um, maybe just snug it up just a hair? So the old tired and proven spring goes back in. There you go. But with a little different adjustment this time. And after a few more laps, Andy's comfortable and confident about his setup for Saturday's race. Well, that's it for Test and Tune. No more runs till Saturday night, the big anniversary race here at this legendary American track. On race day, with near record heat and humidity, the front air dam gets taped up for qualifying. Then it's tech time where Andy's car is well over the 2,850 pound minimum. Can we be lighter? Oh yeah, you can be lighter. <laughs> be quite a bit lighter. <laughs> now he only qualifies six, but with a long race ahead of him, he'll have lots of time to move up. I'm ready. 125 laps. Yeah, we're Jack. We're ready to go. Uh, I think we can win it. For a dozen or so laps, Andy just patiently holds his own, getting a firm feel for the track. Soon, the number 20 car is consistently moving up, with the kind of performance only possible with a skilled driver in a properly set up race car. For some, the heat of the track creates havoc. For Andy, it seems to create opportunities. By lap 50, he's already making a move for the lead. Meanwhile, the 19-car field is steadily shrinking. A number of drivers themselves fall victim to the scorching heat. In the final laps, Andy and his Monte Carlo hang in with a runaway lead. Then suddenly, there's a smash-up right after turn three, and a red caution halts the race. But when the green flag flies, Andy goes back to work securing his biggest late model win of the season. Now we got a killer race car, killer crew. We work hard on, you know, why do they say you win races in the shops? Man, that was awesome. You can pick them, dude. Well, man, working out here on a truck team every week and you get to see the racing and see who's been running up front. And he's been doing real good. That's six in a row. And while the fame and fortune may not rival the ranks of NASCAR, the taste of victory can be just as sweet. We'll see you next time.